All right, welcome this week. We are talking about chapter 21. Um, chapter 21 really, I think, revolves around the idea of the Industrial Revolution or industrialism. industrialism. Um, and, and some things that I want to point out as you read this week, uh, just a couple of big pieces. Uh, one, industrialism changed families and the way that uh, families worked. You get a lot of men that go to work, women also go to work, but mostly if they have uh, husbands at home, the women are at home. But this changes a lot uh, with how we've seen things in the past. One of those is that men and women, especially in the lower classes, uh, were working together to uh, take care of farms, to take care of their any land that they may have, or be working, or they were working for someone else, and they were uh, making products. Now that products are being mass produced, men are going in and working in factories while women are staying home and have lost a lot of uh, the jobs that they were doing. And so and this is where we get a real uh, sense of defined gender roles come out of uh, industrialism. One of those that I think uh, is interesting is really the split between men and women that we've seen uh, thus far. You get met women who are now uh, housekeeping, they are food preparing food or food preparation, child rearing and nurturing. We've seen this throughout time and things have started leading this direction, but really this is the change, uh, the changing point uh, where we see things today, uh, where we really get a sense of uh, normative gender roles and the way that men and women work together. Men were uh, financially to support the family and women were at home uh, working with the laundry, the household duties and household management. Okay, And that's really one of the biggest things that come out of this. Now, I know that we've seen this so far, but really in the middle class to upper classes, uh, this is the first time that we've seen a working class gender norm that we haven't seen to this point. Okay, uh, Most, if men and women were living in poverty, they were doing a lot of the same jobs just to, just to keep themselves afloat or to sustain life. And we haven't seen that to this point. So industrial, uh, industrialism leads uh, to more defined gender roles. We also get a sense of people being uh, stable uh, and the middle class really leaving revolutionary ideas behind and they lean politically one way or another depending on uh, how the economy is going. So in some cases they're more liberal, in other cases they're more conservative, depending on how it's affecting them. And rather than being revolutionaries, after 1848, uh, we see people just leaning on a way that's going to help them to be more stable and uh, financially stable. Okay. One of the big things that I want to point out here, and, and the last one that I want to talk about that we'll spend, I'll spend a little bit of time on, uh, is Marxism. Industrialism leads to Marxism. And I think that we all need to understand this, that Marx really believed that uh, lower classes were being taken, taken advantage of with industrialism. And, and so really what happens here is that you get a lot of people who he thinks, he believes are not being able to sustain life, but they're working long hours and they're being taken advantage of. And so his idea is that he wants to create a communist uh, utopia. Now, this is really a new idea uh, at the time, but it's not revolutionary, okay? It comes out of socialism, and he believes that there are four stages of history and that ultimately capitalism will be the undoing of our history and that will move slowly into socialism and then into communism, okay? To give you the four stages, because the book doesn't do that, I'm gonna give those to you briefly, and it will be something that I want to see in our discussion pieces and especially uh, in our writing as we come up uh, to unit two uh, in a couple weeks. So stage one is the prim is primitive communism, and he says that it's shared uh, property, it's hunting and gathering society, it's more of a tribal society, there's no ownership of land, and there's proto-democracy. And proto-democracy is there's no concept of leadership, okay? He's really looking at a lot of these things that we've seen up to this point uh, in history as it being a primitive culture where we're working together and that that would be primitive communism, okay? Now, I know we've talked about a little bit about this, especially the students were, that were in my 101 class 
uh, last semester. Uh, we've seen some pieces of this, but some of it you're probably going to argue isn't isn't right, and that Marx is Marx is probably a little off in some of this. The second stage is slave society, and we move into a slave society where now we see the emergence of class, which we talked about last semester, uh, a ruling class. Uh, statism, which starts to grow in order to keep the slave or the lower classes in check. Uh, we see agriculture, where uh, people are farming and supporting large groups of people or large population from agriculture. And then democracy and authoritarianism, which both rise or develop at the same point during the second stage. Uh, and then we see private property start to, to build during the second stage. Uh, and private property can be both at this point in second stage, land or slaves. And and he really break, breaks it down into the two. I, I think that you can also see probably some criticism with Marx here as well in the second stage. Uh, just be aware that you've got, that we need to see both sides, where Marx is coming from and and then some of the criticism that lies within that as well. The third is feudalism. As a feudalism stage, we see an aristocracy, which is ruled by monarchs. Uh, we see theocracy, so we see places that are ruled by religion, uh, hereditary class that starts to rise, that we see a lot of uh, people just passing on uh, wealth, okay, and poor, the poverty stricken staying at the bottom and never being able to rise, rise above that station. We see the emergence of nation states, which form from fallen empires, and you get a lot of the people staying in those areas. Um, and so you don't see a lot of the aristocracy uh, being chased out or being overrun by poverty-stricken areas. Instead, they're staying in power because as the empire fell, they were still the ones that were at the top. Okay. Uh, the fourth is capitalism. Well, the fourth is capitalism, socialism, communism. Uh, but that's the fourth stage. The fourth stage. We'll talk about capitalism first. There's a market economy, uh, which we see that starts to grow. That's really where we are today, uh, this idea of market cap uh, economy. And we've been in uh, this stage for 18, since 1848. Uh, well, we have. the Europe is, has changed over time, and a lot, most countries in Europe are social, uh, socialist countries. Uh, some obviously communist countries. You get the idea of private property out of capitalism, and this private property is completely different. This is that you have the aristocracy aristocracy or the bourgeoisie at this time who have bought up all of the land, and it's very difficult for people at the bottom to get any land at all to be able to even work. Uh, you have bourgeoisie democracy, uh, which I, I I really think is where we're at today, where you see multiple generations of people taking over power. Uh, namely, one that comes to mind, and I, I love the Kennedys, uh, but the Kennedy family, which continues to go throughout time, just passing on, and they're not passing it on, we're voting them in, but it's a family that uh, has continued. The Clintons are another one, the Bushes. You see this bourgeois, uh, bourgeoisie democracy, where it just is handed from one family member to another, and they continue to rule. Uh, wage labor, imperialism, and uh, monopolistic tendencies, okay? So wage labor is really one that I want to talk about, the wage labor where uh, you have the proletariat uh, that is selling their wage in order to survive. Uh, that's wage labor. And, and I think that that's exactly where we're at today. We're seeing a lot of that, especially uh, we have a lot of people in the Midwest or uh, in the South who all they're trying to do is find work and selling their way or their labor for wages. Okay, and just to survive. That's what they're trying to do. And they're t you have a lot of people in this country that are working uh, two and three jobs in order just to stay above water. Uh, and then the the idea of these monopoly tendencies where we get this idea of the market forces are moving us to be able to have monopolies and uh, that's that's a hard one to to swallow i think because if you're looking at the market economy you think well the market will take care of itself except we do have a lot of uh, places that wind up starting monopolies uh, or getting caught up in it, and then uh, the government has to come in and say, no, this isn't right. So we've, we've got laws against monopolies, which is interesting. Uh, socialism, 
just to run through the, the last two pieces of this, you've got socialism, which is the idea of common property, uh, council democracy, and labor vouch vouchers. Now, the other two I think are, are pretty self-explanatory, but labor vouch vouchers often get a bad rap, I think. This is one piece that I think is in interesting, but the idea of being able for a worker to be awarded uh, money due to the amount of labor he contributes. Uh, this idea, I think, gets... We, we think about it in uh, American democracy as people not doing things for themselves and it's going to they're going to be lazy, except it really is a, a way that you contribute so much, you get so much. I mean, it's, it's very similar to the way that, that we work. It's just paid out through uh, by a company who isn't state owned yet. That's communism, which is next. Communism is statelessness, classlessness, and property, propertylessness. Okay. Uh, ultimately, those three things lead to no one can exploit someone else uh, for personal gain. And ultimately, I think that's why a lot of people uh, have turned to communism and said, well, this might be a good idea. Uh, I like the idea in theory. We've seen that uh, most times it, it doesn't work. And, and partly because you always need somebody at the top who then uh, puts their friends and family into power and they, they gain all of the things. They gain... Uh, all the wealth and uh, it's never brought down uh, to those people who are in poverty. So that's kind of the idea that I want you to look out uh, for this in this chapter. Uh, I would hope that as we move along that you're able to bring up Marxism and that we're able to talk about some of those things moving forward. Uh, make sure that you do the reading this week and I hope that you have a, an excellent week and we'll talk to you. Uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks. Bye.